let's put lost orders in context because from August 18th to September 13th, there were five sets of lost orders between the Union and Confederate armies. Uh, when Lee was confronting Pope along the Rappahannock line, he had crafted a plan where Jackson was going to march west, led by Stuart's cavalry, and turn Pope's uh, you know, right flank and essentially trap Pope between the two forces and the Rappahannock River and destroy him. Unfortunately, uh, those orders were captured a little village in Virginia called Verdeersville, uh, along with Jeb Stewart's plumed hat and caped coat, uh, and very nearly Jeb Stewart himself. Those orders were in Pope's hands that night, and he responded and moved his army immediately, and the great battle to destroy Pope's army never happened, which is why you don't hear much about that lost order. It's not a battle, and so nobody talks about it. Uh, now, of course, we know Jeb Stuart responded a few days later, riding behind Pope's lines, captured Pope's headquarters, captured his dispatch book with the numbers and disposition of all of Pope's troops, what reinforcements he was expecting. And Lee used that information to craft the campaign of Second Manassas. At the early stages of the campaign of Second Manassas, not once but twice, Pope's orders were intercepted once by Jackson and once by A.P. Hill, uh, which allowed Jackson's forces to be disposed to essentially sustain themselves against Pope's army for a day until the rest of the Confederate army got there. So we've got four exchanges of orders that are immediate. There is no question to their authenticity and are acted upon and avoid bad problems. Now, September 9th, Lee dictates Special Order 191 to split his army into five pieces, three of which are going to surround and eliminate the threat to his rear of the Union garrison at Harper's Ferry. Uh, and that, of course, would be Jackson's command and McLaws Anderson's divisions combined and Walker's divisions. And then Longstreet uh, is ordered uh, to go to Boonesboro. Uh, and the armies move the next day out of Frederick on the 10th. Now, what those orders say and what really happened were quite different. The orders are written on the 9th, distributed, and the army moves on the 10th. The lost order isn't found until about noon on the 13th of September, four days later. And what does it tell McClellan? Well, it tells him something about where Lee is, but much of it confirms what McClellan already knows. Before he finds it, he's well aware that Harper's Ferry is surrounded and cut off. So the order confirms that. But the order says Jackson's going to move by Sharpsburg and cross the river there at Shepherdstown. He doesn't. He goes to Williamsport, and McClellan knows that. He's told that. So the lost order is actually contradicted by the facts. Uh, he also knows on the 13th when he finds the lost order that Longstreet is in Hagerstown, and yet the lost order does not send Longstreet to Hagerstown. So how much faith are you putting in this if it's, in fact, wrong? It's four days old and contradicted by the facts, and there are things that aren't in the lost order, like the fact that Stewart's cavalry has a force in Westminster on McClellan's right flank and rear. That's not in the lost orders. So evaluating it. And the lost order uses ambiguous language. Jackson's command. What's that? And if you don't know, how would McClellan know? Uh, what's Longstreet's command? Because that's mentioned too. It must be bigger than a division because there are other divisions. And yet, after detaching Longstreet's command and Jackson's command and McClaw's and Anderson's divisions and Walker's divisions, all of those troops are going to, and this is mentioned twice in the Lost Order, join the main body of the army. Would that imply to you that the main body is something larger than all these detachments? If it's the main body? Sure, we know today it's a very small part of the army. 
but what does McClellan know then? That's the key question. And he is presented with this order somewhere around noon or later. Stephen Sears is completely wrong that he has it in the morning. Uh, and he acts on it fairly quickly. Now, a lot of visitors, a lot of people who aren't students of this campaign have this idea that McClellan's army is sitting in Frederick on the 13th of September saying, gee, which way did he go? Did he go here? Did we go there? We're not moving. The army was moving. McClellan habitually on the campaign had been issuing orders in the evening for movement the next day. He had issued orders the night of the 12th. The army is in motion on the 13th. So the idea that he isn't responding or moving is false because he's already moving. He is following the orders or the troops are following the orders that McClellan had laid out the night before. When he reads the orders, he sends his cavalry chief Pleasanton out to confirm them. And even before Pleasanton comes back, by six o'clock in the evening, he is issuing orders for an attack the next morning. Uh, I have less experience than my colleague Ethan, but I've been on a number of staff rides and asked professional officers, gee, you get a piece of intelligence and you map out a plan of attack. How long does it take you to do that? And when I tell them that McClellan, McClellan did it in six hours or less, they're impressed. Uh, he has troops moving, in fact, west of Middletown within three miles of Turner's Gap on the night of the 13th of September before anybody is responding to any order McClellan has written that has anything to do with finding 191. So I make the argument and I'm presented this at several roundtables. I'll be doing it next week. Uh, for a roundtable, that really 191 is almost meaningless. It's almost sort of a, eh, it confirms some of what I already know. It con contradicts some of the things that it says by the, you know, the facts contradict it. And it's four days old. And everybody's supposed to be back together by the 12th. And here it is the 13th. And I know they're not. So how important is it really?